Earth Link, Section 6. I found a doorway, a good deep one, so deep that light from street lamps and shop fronts didn't reach the door itself, and you could sit with your back against it and not be seen by passers-by. It was nine o'clock and cold. I sat on my bedroll with my backpack between my feet, watching the bright, narrow rectangle of movement and colour at the end of my little tunnel. People passed continuously, but nobody glanced my way. Nobody knew I was there. Across the street, I could see subway railings with a news vendor's pitch, a road junction and part of King's Cross Station. I sat thinking about my rat-faced former landlord who couldn't spell negotiation and about how one day I'd catch him unawares in a dark alley and about the inventive and wondrous things I'd do to him there. I was angry and a bit shaken, I suppose, but I wasn't particularly unhappy. Not then. My anonymity was a comfort. At least I wasn't going to be seen by people who knew me. Also, I was one among many. My plight could have no curiosity value for anybody who might spot me, and there was no further need to fret about next week's rent. I felt free, I suppose. This was before I became acquainted with some of the setbacks, like hunger pangs and real cold, and the problem of what to do when you have to go to the lavatory and guard your bedroom at the same time. It was this last one which got me first and lost me my doorway and more besides. As I've said, I found my lovely doorway around nine o'clock and for a time it was okay sitting there watching the world go by. In fact, it was quite pleasant in a way. But by 11, my feet and my legs were cold. I was tired. My bedroll was giving me a numb bum and I was dying for a pee. I saw no problem though. The station was just across the way. There'd be toilets in there somewhere. All I had to do was stroll across. The numbness would go and the walk would warm me up. Of course, I'd have to take my stuff. If I'd left it back here in the dark, it might be all right, but you can't take that sort of chance when your bedroll and backpack are all you have in the world. So, quarter past 11, I got up and toted my stuff across to the station. The gents turned out to be halfway down platform one, but there was no barrier. So I motored on down, passing some down and out sitting on benches. The place was underground. I trotted down the steps, beginning to relax like you do when you know relief is imminent and hit snag one. At the foot of the stairs was a turnstile, 10 pence. I dropped my roll and fished my pockets, a 50, two 20s and some copper, no 10. There was a glass box, a sort of office, so there must be an attendant. I called out, excuse me. My predicament was becoming acute. There was no answer, nothing stirred. I glanced all around, chucked my roll over the stile and followed it. Oh, the relief was terrific. Halfway through, the door of a cubicle opened and out popped a runty little guy of about 50 with a peaked cap and a fag hanging out of his gob. Here, he croaked. Have you paid? Uh, no, I stammered. He'd made me splash my trainers. I haven't got... I don't give a toss what you haven't got, son. He was really hoarse. 60 a day, man. I could probably push him over with one hand. I'd been about to ask him to change 20 pence, but his attitude upset me. I'd decided I'd vault the style and save myself 10p. I've no dosh, I told him, zipping up. He stood in front of the turnstile. You don't leave till you've paid. His fag waved up and down as he spoke, sifting ash down his front. I looked at him. Get out of the way, old man. He shook his head. More ash. I moved towards him, swinging my roll. He dodged and swung an inept punch at my head. I ducked, shoved him aside and vaulted the stile. I felt terrific, streetwise and tough but I didn't dare linger in the station. I pictured him in his glass box phoning the railway police. I hurried back up the platform and out to the street. When I got back to my doorway, somebody was there. I didn't see him till I kicked his foot. He leapt up, a six-footer, as wide as the door. What's your problem, whack? I, I was here first. God, what a stupid thing to say. He poked me in the chest. Sod off, kiddo, before I drop you. But I've been here two hours, I protested. I just went in the station for a sod off now. I knew I'd have to go to. This was no chain smoking runt you could knock down with a feather. This guy was what I'd been kidding myself I'd become. Streetwise tough. I turned away with a lump in my throat. I felt like I'd spend the rest of my life being pushed around. It's not fair, I choked. What a wally I was. Fair? If I'd gone straight away, he might not have spotted the watch on my wrist. But he did. He grabbed my sleeve. Nice watch. Giz it. No. The watch was my last treasure. A present from Mum before Vince came on the scene. I tried to pull away, but he tightened his grip. Giz it if you don't want your face smashed in. 
I thought about calling for help. There were plenty of people passing, but I guess I knew it would do no good. Who's going to risk a fist or a knife to help a dosser? I took off the watch and handed it over. It was a struggle not to burst into tears. He grinned, Tawak, very nice of you. Now piss off. I went. <laughs>